Okay, good evening. Uh, so, uh, welcome. Um, before we get started, I'd like to do uh, an acknowledgement to our traditional owners. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wajak Noongar people, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So just some housekeeping rules. Uh, people should keep their mic mute unless they are talking. Uh, people should use the chat function to ask questions at any time and not necessarily wait until the question answer time at the end of the evening. Um, in this way, the panel can pick it, up, pick it up and respond as they go. Um, now, I must let everybody know that the session is being recorded, so we can share with others that were unable to make it to the session. Anyone that does not want to appear should let us know and we can edit out their faces um, uh, later on. Um, finally, uh, we request that participants introduce themselves uh, very quickly um, with just um, 10 seconds max, please. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to unmute each one of you. Um, uh, Cornelius, if you're happy to um, give us a 10 second introduction of yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Cornelius Sitoto. Um, uh, I guess a, a passionate supporter of, of the MAC initiative and also looking forward to, I guess, some of the discussions tonight and how we can um, continue to cascade those to, to our friends and colleagues. Thanks. Thanks, Cornelius. James Menzies. Um, I just unmuted you if you'd like to share with us, please. Hello, everybody. Yep, um, I'm James, and I, um, I've got this little meetup group. Um, um, it's uh, about helping out migrants. Um, or people from interstate in Australia um, um, engage and, and connect with people. So, so um, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Richard Waddy. Hi, yeah, I'm just uh, interested in um, meeting migrants and uh, how they settle here. Um, I've only done 50 years as a migrant, but because um, European, that's sort of different. Um, but anyway, yeah, uh, good to meet you all and um, see how we go. Thank you, Richard. Uh, all right, um, I think that's all we have at the moment. Um, so I'll just move on and do a introduction with our guest speakers this evening. Um, so I'll just quickly go through, uh, give you a background for each of our speakers, if you'll just bear with me. Uh, so first of all, we have Vanessa Wilson. Vanessa is a human resource specialist with Vital Human Resources. Vanessa has been with Vital since its establishment in 2008. And tonight she draws on her wealth of knowledge in this industry gained from over 20 years experience working in both small and big business throughout her career. Whilst running her own small business, she is also general manager with Seasons Funeral Homes. Please welcome Vanessa. Uh, secondly, we have Rika Osaka. Rika is the Director and Training Facilitator with Language and Culture, Culture Proprietary Limited. Rika shares with us her in-depth knowledge and experience of working across different cultures. Rika is a Japanese language trainer, entrepreneur, interpreter, consultant, and senior marketing manager, and has worked across a wide range of sectors to promote and encourage positive cultural diversity. Also this evening, we have Diana McTiernan, Manager of Commission Services with the Equal Opportunity Commission. 
Diana has employment history in the area of labour relations and human resources, where she has worked as both a union and employer advocate, and also a deputy registrar at the WA Industrial Relations Commission. In 2014, Diana managed the EOC's community education team, and Diana's current role is overseeing the community education and complaint handling function of the Commission. Please welcome Diana. Mike Hart is also joining Diana this evening. Uh, Mike is a community education and trainer with the EOC. Mike has extensive experience in delivering both um, EO education to both organisations and community organisations. Mike also coordinates EOC New and Emerging Communities Reference Group. And lastly, this evening, we will hear from Ephraim Asagi. Uh, Ephraim is founder and um, coordinator of the Multicultural Professional Bridge Association. He is a certified project practitioner and has worked with multinational companies in projects in Africa, Australia, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. He has also provided training and teaching services to corporate, corporate groups and students in universities. He is the author of non-fiction books related to a meaningful and whole life experiences for people of multicultural and migrant backgrounds, and including employment, family, and youth. Please welcome Ephraim. Right, thank you. Um, so what I'll do now is hand over to Vanessa. And um, as I say, if you've got any questions along the way, uh, please pop your questions in the, in the chat by um, selecting the chat um, icon at the bottom of your screen, in the bar at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try and get to the questions at the end of each, um, each speaker. Um, all right, Vanessa, please go ahead. Sorry, before Vanessa are coming in, I think some people are waiting to come in, Linda. Thank you. All right, uh, just bear with me a moment. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we're just about to get started with our first speaker. Uh, Vanessa Wilson. Thank you, Vanessa. Hi, well, thanks very much, Linda. Um, I'm here on behalf of Barry, who is from uh, Thinking um, Human Resources, and uh, Barry and I have been uh, colleagues for about 15 years now. So I'm here from a HR perspective, as my background, as Linda said at the beginning, is human resource management. Uh, and my business is Vital Human Resources. So today we're going to look at some uh, workplace tips during this COVID-19 interesting season that we're in. So what we're gonna look at is taking control of workplace issues, okay? And some of those include, so the changes to your employment, also managing workplace relationships, we're gonna look at uh, the COVID-19 workplace issues that may arise and what to do when things go wrong. So we'll touch on all these subjects. And as Linda said, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat box and I'll try to answer them as we go. So the first thing, managing workplace relationships. So, for my whole career, which is a little bit more than 20 years now, I've always found that employment should be a rewarding experience. Employers don't intend to create a difficult workplace, but it is up to us as employees to know our employment conditions and know what your, the expectations are being placed on you from a performance perspective. So how do you know you're doing your job well? And one of the ways to do that is to seek ongoing feedback. I also encourage employees that they need to build trust with their leaders, with their supervisors, with their managers. 
as well as with their teammates and peers. So getting to know your workmates and then finding that common ground helps in all workplace relationships. So what if there are changes in employment as we've experienced recently with COVID-19? So some general principles are um, these changes and a lot of these changes are prescribed in your award or enterprise bargaining agreement or your employment contract may be changed. Um, but just remember they should, if they're changed, they're changed with notice or under conditions specified in your award or agreement. The changes could include rostered hours, days of work, and situations where a shortage of work may result in the standing down of employees. But please go and check your award agreement or contractual agreement for any stand down conditions. Other changes, such as changing employment from full-time to part-time or casual, or reducing your rate of pay where you, your base rate, where you're paid more than your base rate, can only be changed by mutual agreement. That's a very important thing to note. Both you and your employer must agree to the changes. And any changes cannot reduce your rate below the minimum award under Fair Work. Now, I have made the assumption here that most people will be covered by the federal award and not a state-based award. But whether it is federal or state, you just have to go to the relevant um, website to have a look at what those rates are. So some of the workplace issues that may have been created through COVID-19 are issues that are specific for employers and employees. We're all going through this crisis together and it's of no fault of any one person. But here are some of the issues that may affect employees during this period. So you could have contracted COVID-19 or been exposed to someone with COVID-19. So in that case, you may be unfit for work due to illness or injury and in this case, you can access your personal leave this, um, under this inability to work due to COVID-19. This may also be used if you're required to care for a family member or someone in your household who is ill or injured because of an unexpected family emergency, as in COVID-19. A school closed down due to a, the virus outbreak may also meet the definition of an emergency. Another workplace issue is that you are required to isolate because someone you have been in contact with has contracted COVID-19, but you are not actually ill or injured yourself. Now, in this instance, the Fair Work Act does not provide for the use of personal leave, but you may still be required to self-isolate. Your employer is obligated to provide a safe workplace for everyone, and if you don't self-isolate, you may be subject to fines. If it's possible to work from home, then you could continue to be paid for that period. But if not, you may agree to take paid leave. And this has recently changed under the Fair Work Act, where you can take um, annual leave um, at half the rate, or you can take leave without pay for 14 days. Changes to the Fair Work Act also support the JobKeeper payments. And on April the 8th, changes to Fair Work for businesses affected by COVID-19 has allowed for the JobKeeper payments to be made and they will cease on the 28th of September. Only businesses who have been impacted and that can show they have a turnover that has been affected by at least 30% or where their turnover is over 1 billion by 50%. For not-for-profit organisations, their reduction is 15%. And the onus of um, reporting is on the employer to the ATO. The government has um, advised that they will pay the employer 1500 per fortnight 
for each full-time, part-time and casual. There's an eligibility criteria around employees and for casuals, that's a 12 month employment. So they have been employed at March, 1st of March for 12 months for the previous 12 months. And that 1500 per fortnight is a reimbursement to the employer and the employee must receive that payment. This will subsidize an employee's wage if they're earning more than 1500 per fortnight or be the payment if the employee has been stood down. So just remember, if you're an employee who earns more than 1500, that's okay. You will still receive your normal rate of pay and the company will top up to your normal rate. Um, I'm just looking at the chat, but I, um, it says, what about business participants re the 1500? The $1,500 is a job keeper payment and it only goes to those who are employees. If you're a permanent part-time employee and were at the 1st of March, and if, if you were full-time at that point, you are eligible. It is an all, one in, all in methodology that the government has put in place. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by business participant. As in, are you saying if you're a subcontractor or a sole trader? If you could just um, write a little bit more about what you mean with a business participant. But at this moment in time, no, it's, I think with Uber, you're not classed as an employee. A working director, if you are an employee, then yes. It's like if you were a sole trader, you could still, as a sole trader, um, apply for JobKeeper. I am not quite sure how Uber um, employ their drivers, whether they're as employees or as subcontractors. I did believe it was the latter. Um, and I, hopefully I've answered that, James, that sole traders can apply. Okay, so... Again, changes to um, Fair Work to support JobKeeper payments. Um, so they have expanded the definition of stand down during COVID and that is within the awards. Um, but if, employ if an employee cannot be usefully employed for the employee's normal days or hours because of the changes to business, either through the COVID pandemic or the government initiatives, and I'm thinking here more about the cafes, which have been asked to close and beauty places, et cetera, um, they could still get the JobKeeper payments. But an employee subject to a stand down direction is permitted to ask their employer if they can engage in reasonable secondary employment, engage in training or in professional development. And the employer must, must consider this and not unreasonably refuse such requests. Um, Ephraim has asked, do you have to be on the payroll as per ATO reference? As far as I'm aware, yes, you need to be on the payroll. However, um, today I also learned that, uh, you know, a sole trader may not be on the payroll, they may not have a payroll, but they can still apply as a sole trader, okay? Yes, and as a working director. They'll only still get paid the 1500, but at least they'll get paid the 1500. Okay, so an employer at this time can direct the employee to perform any duties that are within their skill and competency, provided the duties are safe. So as in with a cafe, you may have had a barista, you can't serve coffee, you can only do takeaways now, but if the cafe is closed because it's a seated restaurant, um, they can have other jobs done at this same time, so long as it's safe to do so and it's within the competency or skill. 
an employer can direct the employee to perform duties at a place that is different from the employee's normal place of work, including the employee's home, providing the place is suitable and safe and the duties are reasonable. An employee cannot be required to travel an unreasonable distance to a new location. Now, reasonableness is used a lot by Fair Work, and I can't tell you what is unreasonable. I can't give you a distance that would be deemed unreasonable, but it's something that you would talk to your employer about. An employee may ask to take annual leave during this period. And as I mentioned earlier, they can do this by agreement and they can take twice as much leave on half pay. Now that's a recent change to the uh, awards uh, for this specific period of time while we're in COVID-19. Okay, under the arrangements, the employer must give all employees at least three days written notice of a direction or a change, consult the employee um, or the employee's representative about it, keep a written record of the consultation. The direction continues until withdrawn, revoked or replaced with another direction. Now, there are a lot of new directions coming out all the time, so employers and employees need to keep abreast of these changes. This is subject to any fair work order and will automatically end when the law ceases on the 28th of September. And an employee affected by these conditions must comply. Um, another question here. So for a sole trader working on the gig economy, i.e. Uber, and earn less than 1,500 fortnightly, will they qualify or does the employer need to top up it's one in, all in, and everyone gets 1,500. So a casual who may have done seven hours a week regularly, and they may have earned $150, they will get 1,500 a fortnight or 750 a week. Um, there is no less than amount because they were earning less, or there is no top up amount. If they earn more than 1,500, then any hours above that 1500 will be paid by the employer. There's a lot of employers at this moment in time though, providing the minimum, which is the 750 a week or the 1500 a fortnight, and the team are doing the hours to meet that payment. They're not necessarily doing any more above or beyond. So what would you do if things go wrong? So if you feel something is not right, talk to your leader or your supervisor or somebody internally. Check whether it is a matter in your contract or whether there is a formal document that applies that must be followed. I always encourage people to make notes, diarise and record facts. Seek external advice and obviously this panel, there's a lot of people here that can help and try to resolve issues early. Um, so just going back to the questions. So yes, the JobKeeper scheme does end um, at the end of September. And I have to say the date I believe is the 27th of September, but 27th or 28th, it's for a six month period of time. And at the end of that, this will cease. So yes, it does mean that if under Uber, the drivers can claim through Uber. Uber is just acting as a clearinghouse effectively. They will give the drivers the 1500 and Uber will receive the 1500 from the government. Okay? But the employer must pay that in advance. April is, well, is now extended to the 8th of May. Um, we have an opportunity as employers to make those top up payments. And a lot of it in the news has been about, um, if you can't afford to make that top up payment, uh, the government are gonna un underwrite 50% of a loan up to 250,000. And you'd have to go to your bank to get that loan, specifically for this purpose, not for any other purpose, i.e. paying down debt. Um, yes, it does mean that the 1500 has to be paid for April, and that needs to be paid, as I just said, can be paid up to the 8th of May now. It was up until today. 
and I think businesses were struggling to make those payments. Um, if under Uber you were going to get the JobKeeper payment, you would have received the notification form. Okay, so as Linda said, I run my business and another business. So all my employees received that JobKeeper form last week. They all had to complete it by Monday. I know it was a public holiday, but only in WA. And then I lodged uh, Tuesday and Wednesday for all those people that were eligible for JobKeeper. As part of the uh, instructions, employers must inform their employees if they're eligible. They must tell them that they are eligible and then they'll tell them if uh, the business is eligible for JobKeeper because not all businesses are. Remember, businesses have to show a drop of 30%. Now with Uber, they may not be able to because they are one big uh, entity in Australia and I don't know about them specifically, okay? Um, so if Uber doesn't pay 1500 for April to all, then none of the drivers will get it. That may be so. As I said, I can't specifically talk to Uber because I do not know if they can apply. Okay, because bigger organisations, more than 50 billion, can't apply. I'm going to get a wind up soon as well, I know. Um, all right, so what to do when things go wrong? Try to focus on facts rather than emotion. Ask questions to clarify rather than assume or challenge. And that's a good one uh, related to that question about Uber. If you don't know, ask Uber if they are going to uh, receive JobKeeper payments and if they're eligible. That's the easiest way to do it so that you know. Um, remain respectful and focus on behaviour. And, and in case of performance discussion, ask to have a support person present. Any performance discussion at any point in time, you can ask for a support person to be present. They cannot participate in the meeting, but they're there to support you. And that person can then take notes and if they feel that you're under duress, then they can ask for a break to talk to you. Um, and if you are unsure of what is happening, you can ask for the break as well, or be provided with details in writing, especially if English isn't your first language. Then you can ask for outcomes from the discussion in writing and understand what actions are required of you and others and the timeframes around it so that you can understand the consequences of those outcomes. So just in summary, um, I swear to you, employers do not intend to create a difficult workplace, um, but know your employment conditions, your rights under the award and under your contract, and also uh, the changes that may affect you during this time of COVID-19. Everyone may need to be flexible during this period and also clarify and raise issues early and internally if possible. Um, know where to go if you need help externally diarise facts, focus on behaviours and facts, and also be respectful. Issues raised early, um, that means they won't get out of hand and you'll have more chance of resolving them if they go on for too long. Are there any other questions? Um, I've got the um, chat box open if anyone wants to put any questions in there. I think one of the questions that came through is, um, is there an opportunity to get a copy of the slides of the presentation? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Vanessa. We'll um, get that from you and um, circulate it to attendees. Thank you. No problem. Does anyone else have any questions? Can I just say something here? Um, we, we get this come through regularly, Vanessa, the point about support, people cannot say anything during um, situations of meeting with um, the likes of human resource and all the highly motivated people. Because sometimes when people are already in that kind of situation, uh, it's, it's difficult sometimes to get a very fair uh, and balanced hearing. So is there, is there a major reason why support people are not allowed to say something? Are there conditions um, about that? I know we raised this also with Equal Opportunity Commission. I know they have their own opinion, but from human resource point of view, Vanessa, uh, is that not unfair? 
generally um, the support person is there, is there in the capacity of supporting the employee. Um, why they're not permitted to talk is mainly because they don't want to be putting words into the employee's mouth. Uh, from my perspective, I want to hear from the employee. If there is a barrier from an not English being their first language, I would always get an interpreter and you can get them on the phone now very easily. But for me, it's important to hear from the employee, their thoughts and their feelings. Um, a third party who I may not know um, can't really put words into the mouth of an employee. I've also had situations where people have brought um, professionals, um, lawyers and other such and really I go on the basis of I want to talk to the person, I want to find out what the issue is and I want to be fair and equitable in what I'm doing and I find that is can be interrupted by a third person talking or talking over. That's generally why we say the support person is there just to support the employee and really we want to talk directly to the employee. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you, Ephraim. If no one else has got any questions for Vanessa, um, I'd like to um, introduce Rika. Um, Rika will be talking to us about the benefits of cultural intelligence. Um, if we could hand over to you, Rika. Yes, let me just share my screen. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're not seeing just yet, are you? Just a second. We are, we, we can see it. Yeah. Can you? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, that's good. Um, I titled my talk, Being Culturally Effective. And I, I have this company called Language and Culture, and we have been helping uh, people in the area of cultural competency development in the corporations and in communities. And the first photo that I'd like you to have a look is this one. Yeah. What would be the first thought that come to you when you look at this photo? And would you approach these policemen for help or ask for direction. And quite interestingly, when people come from different experiences and different cultures from their heritage, the perception we have to a certain group of people, even to professionals like such as priests, policemen, police force, the perception we have is totally different. And how about this one? Doctors. When you go and see a doctor, do you feel totally fine to ask questions? It was quite funny that I've been away. I'm originally from Japan. And when I went back to Japan, I, had a, I went to see a doctor. And I was with my sister. And as I normally do in Australia, I started asking questions. Okay, well, how about this? How about that? Can you think of any other ways or whatsoever? And then my sister actually elbowed me secretly. I said, hey, sis, don't ask so many questions. She whispered into my ears. And I was thinking, why not? And the fact is that like in Japan, where the hierarchical sense sense of uh, power distance is so strong that we don't actually doubt the capability of doctors policemen or other professions like teachers lecturers we perceive as whatever they say is right 
And then maybe there is an area. It was quite funny also when I was looking for these photos and then key in doctors. A lot of photo came up as male doctors. Same for police force. A lot of photo came up as male police, I mean, policemen. And I had to actually specifically key in female doctors. Oh, this was Japanese doctor. Female doctors to get these photos. So in some ways, we are very um, biased. That is the common thing, I think. Without knowing, without bad intention, we have biases. And like police, pilots, doctors, firefighters, soldiers, carpenters, bricklayers. Whenever we think of these occupations, we tend to think of a certain genders. And then that's where the cultural diversity, the difficulty comes in. And the lecturers, so do you just believe what she says or do you challenge her statement? So all of us have this, all of us, without fail, we actually have our own culture glasses. Subconsciously, we are wearing glasses. And we are looking at outer world through our cultural glasses. And then we make assessment. And the definition of culture by Lasting and Costa is this. Culture is a learned set of shared perceptions about beliefs, values, and norms, which affect the behavior of a relatively large group of people. So the, the first step to um, cultural, intercultural competency development is actually to remove these cultural glasses and have to start to think the norm for myself may not be the norm for others. And there are always two sides to the coin, so, so, so they say. And I'd like to share a research result. This is quite interesting. The attitude towards authorities uh, this is the dimension depending according to the national cultures. And when we look at this, we have two ends. One side is egalitarian, like think that everybody is equal. You know, we should treat everyone more or less in an equal way. And the other side is, of course, the hierarchical. And Australia, where do you think we will fit in? If you can type in, maybe left or right, or a little bit to the center in the chat box, that would be good. More left, equal, anybody else? Sixty percent down the line towards the right. Okay, so the research shows Australia actually fits here. This part, yes, and then I'm afraid I couldn't find any of that uh, um, uh, countries other countries like African countries that Ephraim and Cornelius they are from. But a lot of African countries actually belongs to, belong on this side of the spectrum. And what happens is there is a difference here as well. Here, here how individual perceive authorities, how they feel about authority. There are differences on this side as well. 
However, when we look at the difference from here to here, the gap is huge. And what I'd like to point it out is that how this perception towards the authority, the gap, how it affects how we approach the figure of authority. Okay, let me go to the next slide. Oh, I didn't also, um, there are two, there are a lot of spectrum like this uh, when we look into cultural dimensions. And one of them is like communication. How do you communicate? Ooh. Yeah, communication. So one spectrum would be direct. And then the other side of the spectrum would be indirect. So this is how we communicate differently. And a lot of Asian countries and African countries, uh, Southeast Asian countries, Middle Eastern countries, they belong to more to the right-hand side, indirect, prefers indirect communication. And a lot of Western countries and European countries, they belong to more towards left spectrum. So that means like when we communicate, like, okay, under the COVID-19 situation circumstances, let's talk about the finance. If we are a direct communicator, we may be saying, oh, I'm having a financial difficulties at the moment. It's really tough. But if we talk to people from the other end of the spectrum, we may be saying, oh, I have five children, three goes to primaries and two goes to secondary school. So what's the message? The message that two people want to send out may be the same. They have financial difficulties. But how people say it, perhaps it's different. And also spectrums like individualism, collectivism. A lot of Western countries tend to be, um, according to the research, you can look into um, the research result by uh, Maya. Erin Maya, she has published a brilliant book. It's called The Cultural Map. She goes into details about these two end of the differences in cultures. And quite interesting because individualism, again, the other side will be collectivism. Okay, trusting people, how do we trust people? One end is task-based, the other end is relationship-based. So that means like trusting people, start talking about the problems. The people on the relationship-based culture, they need to trust the person to start talking about the difficulties. And on the other end, those people who come from the culture, which is a very task-based, they can maybe jump into expressing the difficulty straight away because that is the task they need to complete. So this is how the culture, the two ends of the spectrum can come in our way. So authority, think about the authorities. So how we perceive authority, figure of authority. If we come, if a person comes from a very hierarchical culture, to approach that authority can be a challenge. And then that's where the part, we need to remove our culture glasses. In other words, if we, your culture perceives authority as something that I need to be careful with, we got to remove that and say, okay, I am in Australia. There is a help. 
and there is um, um, people with authority who can help me and have to stop think like that way and then also the other way around um, it is quite important for those people who come from egalitarian culture to understand that fear or the hesitation that other cultural background that people with other cultural background may have approaching the authority. So figure of authority. So this has to be changed. Um, I am a migrant. I came from Japan and I had to learn also as one of the member of the community in Australia that when I face issue, or by the way, like consulting, having a financial advisor, having an accountant, these are the things that I was not quite used to because in Japan, not many people, only the rich, wealthy people had financial advisors. But that is not the case in Australia. So these are the things uh, that the migrants or the newcomers that have to learn about what is the culture here in Australia and have to take that first step to approach. And know what our right is by knowing what our right is and then we have to be mindful of being culturally effective so no having that knowledge okay we have the rights and we recognize that australian authority is in general have is going to help me and have to have that knowledge and also have to put that knowledge into uh, action and that was the hardest part and I think two or three of you have listened to my orange juice story sometimes just knowing about this that cultural difference is not good enough for us to put it into action because it is quite challenging and this is my little um, story about the orange juice um, obviously my first language is Japanese and the English is my second language. And the first time when I went to US, I was staying with the host family and at the dinner table, I was offered orange, a glass of orange juice. And the, my host mother, according to my um, hierarchical culture, she is of course in a higher ranking than me, asked me, would you like a glass of orange juice? And my answer was straight away, without any pause, I said, no, thank you. And she said, okay, you can have a glass of water then. And then the second night comes, she asked again, would you like an orange juice? And I said it again, no, thank you. And then I was, I kept on thinking, no, 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 no. In, in America, I got to be very direct. I have to speak direct. So if I want orange juice, I have to say, yes, please. So that's my knowledge. I have to ask for something I need. But another night comes, would you like a glass of orange juice? And then I go, no, thank you. And it was automatic and I was very frustrated because I had that knowledge. I had to be direct, I have to be direct and I have to ask for something I want but I couldn't do it. So one night, another night came and I made up my mind. I was very determined to say, yes, please. I practice it in my bedroom. Yes, please. Yes, 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 yes. Maybe yes, please is two words, too difficult. So I'll just say yes. And then the night comes and then she asked me, would you like a glass of, you, are you sure you don't want a glass of oranges? And I say, yes. Yeah, I didn't get the oranges. So it's hard. The knowledge, putting the cultural difference knowledge, putting into action is not easy. So what I would suggest is, first of all, I think um, as migrant newcomers, 
the somebody who are placed in a new culture, I think we need to know ourselves and then see where we place ourselves if there is a spectrum of left-hand side and right-hand side in terms of communication, power distance, trusting people, and there are more and more and more spectrums. There is a wide range. It's not the point that's where we live in, but there is a range of the degree of differences in ways that we operate. So know yourself. And I think what we have to do is to step back and assess. So Vanessa was talking about, okay, when you don't feel right, yeah, talk to someone. Exactly. So when we don't feel right, I think it's quite important that we don't jump into action. We don't jump in to say something. It's more like to step back, take a deep breath and assess. And then have a plan. If I can speak to somebody by myself, plan what I am going to say, how I'm, I'm going to say. The, when we come from uh, indirect um, communications culture, that has indirect communication style. Even when we speak, we don't speak what we want at the beginning. We normally say some sort of stories. Da 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 da. And then in the end, we tend to say something we want. So we may have to think of our strategies. Okay, in Australia, communication style tend to be very direct compared to um, non-Western countries, non-Western cultures. So if I am talking to somebody who is not aware of the way that I, Asian culture, people from Asian culture speak, and then my strategy would be, okay, I better restructure how I speak and say what I want to say, so what part? Say what I want first, and then maybe followed with the explanation. So I need to have the plan and the strategy. And then, same as the orange shoes, I kept on doing, making the same mistake. And I was frustrated because I knew what I needed to do, but I just couldn't do it effectively so that particular time maybe what i needed was to explain the cultural differences explain explain to the person that i am speaking to okay look my culture is for me it's not easy to t explain to you what is going on with me at work because i have this culture that i don't disclose so easily to people about my personal things or about my problems and I really don't know you. I only met with you twice. So explain or ask for help. Ask for a professional help and act on behalf of yourself, ourselves. I think that will be the steps to take. So to me, just put it simply, intercultural competences to acknowledge that there is a various types of um, re repertoires of how to communicate, how to build trust, how to um, respect authorities. So there is a range and spectrum and the cultural competency is to move around this range spectrum and adjust our approach because unfortunately we cannot change uh, the other parties but what we can do is that what sort of level the other person is and we work on ourselves to adjust our approach yeah so that's intercultural competence and then of course for um, for all of us it is important to be aware 
to be really aware. So we all are wearing, subconsciously, we are wearing these glasses and we got to, if something is not right or it doesn't sit well with us, it is worth looking into cultural differences and remove that, your own culture glasses and then look at from the other angles. And also, um, uh, Vanessa was also mentioning about the language, the English as a second language. It is a huge, huge challenge. Um, the way we speak in direct, direct is an, also one thing. And also um, English, it's quite funny. The English learners tend to aim to be, to speak English like an American person or the British person, which in my opinion, we will never speak like them. We will have the speaking English as a second language. We will continue to have our accents and then maybe we speak it differently. But we got, um, those people who speak English, we got to sort of gain our confidence because in the whole world, the native speaker of English is only 400 million people in about 53 countries and against people who speak English as a second language is 1 billion people. So my conclusion is most of the time nowadays when we speak English, you may most likely speak to somebody who speak English as a second language. So a little bit of accent, intonation, we don't have to worry about it, but maybe speaking English as a um, second language, we need to speak a little slower so that the people who, are, who doesn't have a high tolerance level towards a different accent can actually understand us. Yeah, that's the end of that presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rika. Does, do we have any questions for Rika? Uh, please put them through on the chat, uh, the chat box. In the meantime, um, there's a really useful cultural atlas website. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, uh, Rika, but um, I came across it in my studies and it is a very useful tool or can be a very useful tool. Uh, when learning to communicate with people of other cultures, even just taking a look at ourselves and the way we Australians communicate. Um, it's, it's quite an entertaining and educational website. Um, so uh, if anybody would like um, the web address for that, we can send that through to participants as well. Um, so let's have a look. Have we got any chats? No, we don't. Ephraim, would you like to say anything? Yes, uh, Linda. Why we're waiting for a few more? I think someone said yes. I think someone wants the Atlas. I think so. Um, but while we're waiting for a few more questions to come through, uh, Rika has really gone quite general, which I think was very useful because some of the principles there can be applied beyond Mark, which is why we're here today. Uh, bringing it into the context of the earlier presentation by Vanessa, remember, record I asked a question where someone of a different background who now calls Australia home, who is working in some kind of company who seem to be having a little bit of HRO, human resource challenge. Having the presentation we just had from Rika, so you can imagine how challenging it may be, Vanessa, where you have such a person, and you've made a very good point in that you want to hear the fact, you want to hear from the person, you want to get the person's view, but oh, this person we are referring to, uh, going back to Rika's chat about communication, 
that person may go to Jericho before coming back to Australia to you. And as a human resource expert who may not have attended, let me promote Rika a bit, who may not have attended Rika's session on intercultural competence, it may become a bit of a challenge. So I just want Vanessa to, to train a little bit there in the light of what you presented earlier on, and particularly with Mark, uh, recall that this person may already be feeling a, a little bit of trauma as well. Uh, it's gone through issues, a little bit disorientated, trying to recover and just be stable. And then the person is called into a performance or human resource meeting. And then having in mind what Rika just shared with us. It, I, I think there's a need for some form of equity, uh, Vanessa. What do you think? The question you asked me earlier was about why don't we hear from the support person, okay? So I have, especially in the funeral home, many diverse, culturally diverse people working there, and especially from uh, Europe, okay? And being the general manager there and female, they struggle to communicate with me, okay, as the boss. They're not supposed to talk to the boss, and if the boss talks to them, they're in trouble. So we, together with this person, have overcome that because it's different in Australia, as Rika said. You know, not only does the employer have to help, but the employee has to also recognise that they're in a different country, as she said, and we have to overcome our own inhibitions because we are very egalitarian in Australia. So... From my experience, when there has been a cultural difference or there has been a language barrier, which there still is a language barrier that with this person who's worked with me for five years, we have to translate on our phones. But I actually talk to his wife a lot more. So she joins me in meetings with this person and she translates over the phone. And then she tells me what he says. And that's why I said I, I, I'm happily have a translator in any meeting. So long as the employee is speaking, they don't have to see me, they don't have to look at me, they can talk to the translator who tells me what they say, but it's still so important to engage with the employee as we try and help them transition into how we do things in Australia. Does that, does that help or make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, I think, I think uh, it's a very good point that we, especially for us that are, that are also... Uh, uh, we've come to settle in Australia, it's not home. Um, um, I, I think the conversation is beginning to be, could there be a middle point at some, at some time? Because Australian is multicultural. Um, I know that, uh, that, that that conversation has come up over and over again. What is Australia now? Uh, what's the identity of Australia? So while we know that there is that, that egalitarian Australian, that direct Australian, but we are beginning to recognize that quite a, a percentage, which is getting higher, of the Australian we're referring to is no longer that Australian. So how do we begin to have that conversation about a middle point so that everyone can be included? Look, I think that is a tough question. Um, and I can't answer on behalf of all the businesses in Australia. I can only answer on, on what I would try and do to achieve a more middle point. And I think to a degree, I've been able to do that by getting in trusted support people to help me have those meetings. And some of the meetings aren't performance related at all. It's just about communicating. It could be a communicating a change in contract. And in this instance, it was, you know, because of COVID, because of having to stand people down, you know, to be able to communicate that effectively, the middle ground for me was to talk through the partner, the wife, okay? Um, but will all businesses do that? Unless it is legislated, I'd say not. Um, but I thoroughly believe that employers need to work with their employees, no matter what their background. And I'm a migrant myself. I've been here 25 years, okay? And where I came from, which was the UK, is actually quite different. It is more authoritarian over there to how we are over here. So we've all had to adjust to a different way of doing things, a more relaxed style over here. But I think the middle ground is to work with an employee and that, and 
my background culturally is about working with employees to get the best out of them. You've employed them, they're in your business. I would say most migrants work harder than, than most and they want to do the best that they can. And it's working with that to find out how you can make that happen. But you do need to have an understanding employer at the same time. But I think we can both meet in the middle. Thank you so much. That's great. Okay. Um, right. We may take a break now uh, for uh, five minutes so people, to allow people to get up and have a stretch um, before we resume uh, in five minutes, I think, Ephraim? Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, Linda, just so there was a comment there. I don't know whether that is meant to be answered, Joy, or whether it's just an observation for Vanessa. Um, yeah, I want her to answer that, please, Vanessa, because a lot of the time you've had people, I've had experience of, you know, coming in contact with a lot of people that have had issues and they are told not to let anybody know. So you are, I know you are a bit more open, you know, to even get somebody to interpret. But for these other employers or the managers, you know, are asking somebody, they know these people are from a culturally, um, you know, a different culture and English is not their first language. And they are asked to come in alone. They can write on the letter, you know, you, you are allowed to bring a support person. At the same time, they are stated they should not let they should not, except for their support person, they shouldn't, um, what is it, what, they shouldn't um, let any other person know something like that due to, you know, the confidentiality, you know, clause, you know. But to me, I feel a lot of the time, people that have had this issue because of what they're already going through, you know, simple things, you know, they could have, you know, be reminded of, about or something that could help their case or that could help the issue make make them remember they they don't get this advantage because they are being told not to tell somebody else it might even be maybe a colleague at work that could come to their defense but by the time the colleague gets to hear of it you know there there might be decisions that have been taken you know that I don't know, it's always, it's happened more than one, you know, to, to more than one person that I know of, you know, with mm -hmm. that clause, you know, not to tell somebody else or not to let anybody know, or mm -hmm. not to let them know. You know, by the time you knew, things were already, you know. Mm -hmm. Look, the hard thing is about confidentiality, okay? And it does depend on the issue. All right, if there is something that is misconduct in, in whatever form, confidentiality ought to be maintained. If there's a disagreement between two people, confidentiality should be maintained because we still go on the lines of innocent until proven guilty, okay? And businesses are allowed to do an investigation. Um, and what we said right at the beginning was, if there is a process, a policy or a procedure in place, the employee needs to be across that, okay? They need to say, what is the policy for raising a complaint, for having a grievance? And most companies will have that policy. Okay, if they don't, they just go to the Fair Work website and have a look there of what the minimum conditions are. Every single person comes under the national employment standards, every single person, okay? So that has to be adhered to. When an employer asks you not to talk about it, you have to assess whether it's because of confidentiality reasons, okay? And let's take things at face value. If it's because they don't want gossip or they don't want negativity in the workplace, you know, we, we've got to respect that as well. But there are processes and procedures in place and you can elevate that. So if it doesn't, if the supervisor doesn't respond, then you go to the manager or you go to HR or you ring fair work. That's why they're there. You call them and you say, this is the situation I'm in. Can you give me some advice? If it's about equal opportunities, then maybe you go to the EOC. 
but there are avenues if you're not being treated fairly. Now, obviously, I'm of the opinion that everyone should be treated fairly, okay? So I'm probably, like I said, more on that left-hand side. So, but if you're not, you need to take action and you need to do something about it. Um, but gossiping isn't the thing to do because the managers will hear about that and that sometimes can devalue the point you're trying to make, okay? Going through the process and following it because if it does become a fair work claim, okay, and you followed the process that's been laid down, that goes in your favour. And if they haven't followed the process, most things fail at fair work because due process is not followed, okay? Um, and if they say, no, you can't bring a support person, you know that you can. You know that you can have somebody there, especially if English is not your first language and you can request that to occur. If there's a union in your workplace, join the union. Look, I used to work um, with a very large organization called West Farmers and there was a union. We did not have an adversarial relationship with the union. We had a partnership with the union. Okay, I'm not saying everyone's like that. I, I obviously have rose colored glasses because I had a fantastic experience through the West Farmers Group with the union. Okay, and I know that sometimes it's, it's not that way, but that's what they're there for. They're helped there to advocate, like the EOC are there to advocate as well. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. I have. I think that was just, yeah, I think that's. In case there's still uh, some left of it, Joy, we can come back to that. But obviously, uh, Vanessa has done some justice to that. There's a bit of question from James, but James, we'll just keep that. We'll still have time at the end. We'll come back to that and get, uh, obviously, there's a lot being directed at Vanessa today. It goes to show the importance of, of having the HR voice here. Um, we have provision for a five minutes break. I was just thinking, Linda, whether we'll check with people. Uh, do we want to take the break, just a stretch? I'm happy to continue. Yeah, me too. Okay, so now we can just get it finished. <laughs> Uh, sorry, we, yeah, we're just looking, we've just asked if people want to continue or have a break. Now I've unmuted everyone, everyone. Uh, could you sh uh, share whether you'd like to continue or you'd like to take a break? Yeah, continue. All right. Bye. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. I've just put everybody back on mute. I think it looks as though we're going to continue. Um, so next up we have uh diana um right where are we diana um are you ready to go hey. yes we can hear you and can you see me yes all right now i also i don't know whether i can share my screen i think i sent my um presentation to ephraim are you Ephraim, are you able to share that? Does that work? Yeah, I'll just unmute Ephraim. Um, Ephraim, are you able to share? Yep, right. here we go. Yep. All right, please go ahead, Diana. All right, let me see. What's that? Oh, okay, I don't know whether you can see it. I'll need somebody to click through the the slide. Anyway, good, um, good evening everyone. Um, I will be sharing this free presentation with Mark Hart. I think we introduced Mark earlier. So he might need to be unmuted, Linda. All right. Yeah, I've just unmuted myself. That's right. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so we'll um, interchange between um, the bits of information we're providing. Um, 
in terms of my first slide or our first slide, we have just given that overview. I think most people that are participating um, for me with our presentation have done a range of those. But just to recap, so we're going to um, capture what might be covered by the Equal Opportunity Act or the other anti-discrimination legislation and uh, what people might avenues of action they might have or if something detrimental happens. Um, but just to recap recapture that we have um, our object is to try to under the Equal Opportunity Act to eliminate as far as possible unlawful discrimination and to promote that recognition and acceptance of people within, of everyone within the community. So our role is also to inform and educate and that sort of doing these type of sessions is, is really useful for members of the community who might get access to equal opportunity information through their workplaces. Um, and just taking up on one of Vanessa's last points, I think it's really important too that we need to emphasise we're not an advocacy body. Our role in terms of dealing with complaints of discrimination is to investigate and to attempt to resolve those. Um, we don't have a sort of an arbitrary function. Um, the State Administrative Tribunal has that, but we're the gatekeeper for complaints. But we're not an advocate body. Um, but we do advocate for systemic change. So when we see a raft of issues that come in um, and clearly there is uh, a bigger problem than just the individual um, problem that's been presented, we will look to have those matters resolved um, somehow or, or push for that change. Like for example, we're just doing a um, submission to the change of the, the review of the Residential Tenancies Act. There's a range of issues within that that we see as, as being systemic issues that need to be addressed and we will make recommendations on things such as that. The other thing um, is that, and particularly at this time, our commissioner worked with other anti-discrimination bodies and they just recently um, released a circular about common issues that are occurring across all of Australia that have an impact through the COVID-19. Clearly lots of things have an impact through the COVID-19 um, issue. Um, and they've identified some of those. Some of those are discrimination issues and some of those are human rights issues. So we'll touch on those as we go through the session. So we we'll get to the next slide. So look, the, it is all really new territory and we have um, at the moment a lot of inquiries relating to COVID-19. Um, and we've had a few complaints which are just sort of fairly much in the early process. So I can just give a very general overview of what those issues may be and what the considerations for us might be. Um, and some of those, again, so Lynn, um, so Vanessa's presentation was sort of quite relevant um, there because she outlined a range of circumstances and, and she's right that a lot of those issues are going to be covered in people's awards or their industrial agreements. But there are also some protections that we might, uh, people might have under the Equal Opportunity Act or any of the federal acts as well. So if we consider the type of situation that is, we're getting quite a lot of inquiries that people who feel that they might be in one of the more vulnerable uh, categories that people because of their age or people because they have an underlying condition who have uh, a re will request or a recommendation from their doctor to work at home and that is being denied to them then that might be the basis of putting in, uh, an in um, a discrimination complaint. Um, we might say and again I think uh, Vanessa touched on this. So obviously, it depends on what the job is. So if your job is serving in a cafe, then um, working from home is not really feasible. Um, but there are a lot of jobs where it is possible with not that um, significant adjustment from the employer. And we would say that that should be given consideration. So there's a type of 
some of the examples of the complaints that we're getting there. People also might have that they have to have carers' responsibility. Again, that should be covered generally by your industrial agreement or your award, but it would also potentially be the basis for filing a complaint under the Equal Opportunity Act for family responsibility or alternatively under the Federal Sex Discrimination Act because that has a family responsibility provision as well. Are there any questions on that? We, they can come up as they go through. Um, the other type and more specifically impairment discrimination is someone who's applied for a job and then and it seems all possible and then because they have a condition they don't feel it's a problem but the employer this happens um, besides the incidents of COVID but I think it's happening more regularly because of this um, then they are denied the employment contract because they have that underlying condition which doesn't really impact on their capacity to do the job. It's, I suppose, what the employer might say is a risk factor. So that would have to be tested, but it would be potentially the basis of a complaint of impairment discrimination. So you might have somebody who has type two or type two or type one diabetes, that's all very managed, but the, um, the employer doesn't want to have the risk of having that person on the website. Or people might be in an age cohort that's deemed more vulnerable, or somebody might have an asthmatic condition, but again, it's quite managed. So that would be the type of situation where somebody would look at having a complaint if they were denied employment on that basis. Mark, do you want to talk about the next? Yep. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, no, that's the, the previous one. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting onto that. Um, I just wanted to talk about the race, um, the rise in race-based vilification and discrimination. And um, you know, there was a survey you might have been aware of in April uh, done by a group called the Australian uh, Asian Australian Alliance, which actually um, pointed out that there was 178 uh, incidents in two weeks of um, racial um, behaviour in public uh, against mainly Asian Australians, um, which is quite you know, so, you know, I sort of just nearly dropped the dropped the computer when I read it, um, and and basically it was um, not just online. I think I think a lot of people think well, a lot of these attacks are online by anonymous people. In fact, 147 of those 178 were actually on the street or in the shopping centre or in a, in a public transport, that sort of stuff. So you know, vary the behaviour varied from you know verbal attacks to um, to sort of um, you know physical assault. Um, in some instances, spitting, which is you know, just appalling sort of behaviour. But, you know, it, it, it all stems, a lot of this sort of stuff stems from people's anxiety, fear, um, and blaming others for, for the issues, which is obviously we know is, is, is not, you know, the virus doesn't discriminate, but people do. You know, so I guess, that, 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 I don't know if you've noticed that personally yourselves in terms of some of the increase in, in, in behaviour. I mean, we see it in supermarkets where... You know, you see people panic buying and, and people's anxiety comes out in other ways as well. But, you know, certainly you've noticed the, you know, a, a real spike. And the Australian Human Rights Commission, which is the federal body for discrimination, has actually also seen in February and March an increase, a dramatic increase in the complaints of race discrimination and racial vilification. So um, it's, it's really, um, you know, sort of something which, uh, again, people need to know what their rights are in this situation because there's often, um, you know, some redress. There's also police acts, you know, that you can go to the police if, if there's something really um, sort of uh, serious happens, um, particularly if it's physical abuse, you know, the, and, you know, the game, the uh, survey that I mentioned only showed that only 5% of people actually reported the incident to police. So it was sort of really people just um, get very um, sort of uh, worried and scared, but they, they really can't, um, or really don't choose to, to take the, the take it further. Um, the Federal Race Discrimination Act actually has um, within racial hatred and racial vilification within its um, uh, within its sort of act. So people can lodge individual complaints of discrimination, um, you know, 
in, in terms of that um, to the Australian Rice Commission. The Equal Opportunity Commission law, the Equal Opportunity Act is a little bit more restricted in how you can, you know, racial harassment only applies in employment. So if you cop a, a racial abuse at work, obviously you can lodge a complaint with us. But, um, you know, and also in education and accommodation. But in, in terms of the Federal Act, the Federal Act covers a, a little bit wider range of stuff. Same with sport, you know, like if people are abused racially on the sporting field, they can and often uh, lodge a complaint with the Human Rights Commission. So there is two two acts there that protect people, as well as the police. Um, so you know, states have um, inciting racial hatred sort of type of um, legislation as well. So there's lots of protection there, but a lot of people don't, aren't aware of it. Um, and so you know, people if they are subject to abuse, um, probably the first thing to do would be to give us a ring, and 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 we can put, point people in the right direction in terms of that. Back to you, Donna. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And I yep. think just to add on that point, and we, um, and I think we've told um, and spoken to Ephraim about that our act is due and had been announced for a review that's probably been put on hold for a bit longer now. But one of the provisions that we have strongly advocated for is that we do have a racial vilification provision within the state act. It's quite important. It almost got there in 2008. Um, and then there was a state election and it just went off the radar. So it's really important that um, in terms of that systemic issue that we can try to deal with those um, matters locally as well, rather than people having to, you know, as Mark said, that protection is there, but it is um, more difficult to try to pursue through the Australian Human Rights Commission, just by virtue of them being based in Sydney. Um, and just then going to law enforcement of the COVID-19 measures, I suppose one big change that's happened, um, and this is more a, a more generic human rights issue, is that a lot of the states, and Western Australia included, have um, a law enforcement capacity. Uh, I don't think WA police have probably been um, as aggressive as in some other states where they've been you know really heavily policing people in outside areas um, but it is something that changed and I suppose we uh, were cognizant that you know a lot of uh, migrant groups that it is their sort of social um, gathering is having big groups and whether that's perhaps been exercised fairly and reasonably I don't know whether anybody um, has had a negative experience on that that line, but we would say that our commissioner would be interested in hearing from anybody if they felt that the policing of it had been sort of a bit skewed um, unreasonably. Was she there? Yeah, we, I, we certainly got that message. Uh, oh, here we go. We've, we have a, um, a question. Um, Diana, have you, uh, hi Diana and Mike, what can people do when faced with these discriminations and, and their, under, and their okay. denials? All right, look, I'll come, can I come to Joy's question shortly because I'll just talk about some of the issues about our complaint process. Um, because invariably there are denials, but I'll come back to that. And I'll just cover off on the last point on protection for tenants. Um, and it, is that okay? Yes, please. Okay. So, um, and people would be aware, so under our Act, we do have um, the accommodation is one of the public areas of life. And so um, discrimination on the basis of a person's um, race for either getting a tenancy or the conditions under which the tenancy are granted uh, are something that might arise. So people should be aware that that is something that, you know, and we have from time to time get numbers of complaints about that type of matter. And that's when there's the tenancy is going to be subject to a formal lease. It won't occur if somebody's just renting a room in a house of, of a person who still remains living in there. So um, 
And the other thing, of course, that we have is there has been extensions, not an equal opportunity issue as such, but there is the protection for tenants of people have been unable to, um, or are suffering financial hardship because they have lost their job or they've had reduced hours in their employment, um, that tenants cannot be evicted for that reason if they can show that they have that financial hardship and they can't make their debt, um, their rental payments at this stage. So the Residential Tenancies Act has been changed to give that protection. So I assume most people might be aware of that, but it's something to bear in mind that those type of issues would still have to go through the Department of uh, Mines and Industry Regulation and Safety because they have the carriage of enforcing that uh, the Residential Tenancies Act, but the Consumer Protection Line has um, an inquiry line that would help people if they need to follow up on that. Um, so, Joy, your question about when people are faced with discrimination, we get a complaint and it's pretty rare that once if we put the complaint to the respondent, because that is part of our investigation process, um, It'd be pretty, sometimes we do, somebody there's an admission, yep, this discrimination happened and the matter, if that's the case, usually can get resolved. In most cases, there is a denial or there's another explanation for why different types of actions were taken. So um, why an, an employee might perceive that it's discrimination, there might be reasons that there has been underperformance. Um, but our process hopefully, you know, it aims to try to get a resolution between the parties. So in this type of the earlier cases that I raised um, about what might give rise to a discrimination, if somebody feels that they haven't been given a fair go and not being allowed to work from home, and that would be ideally the best thing, we have a conference. We could try to work out what the logistics are and whether to what extent that might be possible. Um, so when there are denials, um, we try to get as much detail from both parties. Our complaint process is at the moment that generally the um, responsibility for proving the complaint lies with the person filing the complaint. So, and that is that's a difficult process to prove that it is motivated by racial discrimination or impairment discrimination. Um, but our process at least makes that a bit more open. And the person, um, the employer will be questioned about why they took certain actions. Sorry, Dan, can I just quickly ask, with this, um, with this COVID situation, does it make it easier for EOC to really um, bring justice because um, everyone is under pressure. Uh, take, for example, the job keeper situation. I think there's a lot of loose ends there that could allow employers, and to be fair, it's on both sides, we want to keep jobs. But I think there are some loose ends that may allow the employer to keep those they want to keep. Oh, and definitely that is the top. Oh, that is another good example of from. Um, and I think that one of the cases that we have at the moment um, would seem that the employer has used this circumstance to um, perhaps let go of somebody who they, they felt was a problematic employee but they've used one of the, uh, this person was an older person um, and that used that reason that they felt that they were more vulnerable and in the workplace and therefore would be um, in that person's best interest not to keep working. Yeah, so that that is the type of thing it could. I mean, clearly for a lot of employers, this is a highly problematic um, environment to try to keep um, the ship running um, and to 
to try to be fair to everyone, but I suspect in some cases it's, okay, well, this might be a way we can resolve this ongoing problem and use it as a reason. So if that was the case, um, we'd still have to know that it's because it, if, if it was the older person was the one that got um, jettisoned because, and it was only because they were an older person, then that would be potential, um, potentially unlawful discrimination on the basis of age. But if there were other reasons, like valid reasons, then that would cut across the complaint. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Um, th they were the major things that, you know, what, just what we're seeing, because obviously it, it, it is quite unique um, at the moment, um, because there's so many unknown things about the condition and there's a lot of assumptions being made by employers about people's capacity and how it's going to happen. There's obviously also a lot of concerns from people who have underlying conditions and, and about what that might mean for them and trying to find that balance between protecting people and making sure that they're safe, um, but making sure that they're still being able to do essentially their job, um, but with some adjustments. Now, Mark is also going to talk about, I and mean, this is a bit off that particular point, but also a very other um, current issue in the Australian workplaces um, with sexual harassment. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll be very quick. I, I realise we're over time, but um, just in terms of before we were engulfed by COVID, there was a, a major report board handed down by the Australian Human Rights Commission um, into sexual harassment. Some of you may have heard of it. It was actually, um, uh, it's actually available on the um, Human Rights uh, Commission website, Australian Human Rights Commission website. So it was over an 18 month period, they consulted thousands of people into, into the incidents of sexual harassment in the workplace. And the report was released in, 20, in March. Um, and the couple of figures for you, the estimate, estimated cost of sexual harassment in Australian workplaces is three point eight billion. Let, let that sink into your head for a minute. Three point eight billion it costs the Australian economy. Thirty three percent of people who've been in the workplace for the last uh, five years have said they've experienced sexual harassment. That's a third. Now, sexual harassment. Just for those of you who haven't, heard, you know, who don't know the legal definition, there's two key words here. It's unwelcome behaviour of a sexual nature. So, in other words, if it's unwelcome and if it's sexual, potentially it's sexual harassment. Um, so, women made up 39. Well, 39 percent of women said they'd been sexually harassed. 26 percent of men said they'd been sexually harassed. So, um, it, it, it is a, a widespread problem as far as the as far as the workplace is concerned. Now, uh, sexual harassment can, can, there's a continuum of it. It can be, um, you know, things like jokes, comments, up to, you know, basically physical um, assault in the workplace. And, and, you know, some of the nastier cases we've seen have, have involved that. Um, questions about private life, that sort of thing. The most common things are the verbal things, but anything, as you said, that's unwelcome or that it actually um, it is actually sexual or seen as a sexual and, and it's, the intent is irrelevant and that's that's the key point of it um interestingly this is an interesting point the victim said that the harasser was most commonly a co-worker employed at the same level which is quite interesting because i always thought that sexual harassment was a power issue you know power uh, over someone you know and you'd imply that it was a manager uh, but it, it can often happen with peers working together there may be still power issues but it's peers often that that, that that um, experience that sexual harassment. Um, obviously then, you know, what, what sort of industries, the high risk industries can include things where it's male dominated due to the ratio, it could be, you know, there might be a, a higher representation of men in senior roles, you know, your classic cases of the lawyer, the legal profession where you've got a lot of senior male lawyers and maybe female interns coming in and, and, and actually, met, you know, they're being mentored by these males and, and obviously that can, have, a, have an issue. It can be in the trades. It can also be um, where you've got a high level of contact with clients, such as the hospitality industry. You know, th those sort of places are more prevalent, sexual harassment more pre prevalent. And then you've got the hierarchical things. So things like police, um, armed services, etc. So they're the, where it, it, it's, it's particularly pre prevalent. 
Uh, obviously, sexual harassment has a massive impact on, on individuals who experience it, but also on employers who don't deal with it uh, because it can be a lot of high turnover, lost productivity, negative impact. People won't, you know, if, if an employer gets a reputation, obviously it's going to be a problem for them to employ quality staff. So all those things, it impacts on the individuals, but also on the, on the people. Um, on the companies. And so what the, this um, inquiries uh, made some recommendations in terms of access to prevent se sexual harassment. So prevention is thing like it comes from the top leadership, having leadership, having, um, you know, learning from past experiences, building good cultures, um, you know, even such things as bystander approaches where people um, pick each other up for, for inappropriate behaviours because often it can start with attitudes, basic attitudes that are interesting that Vanessa was talking uh, and also Rika was talk were talking about the, the sort of the picture of, of the you know, typical doctor or the typical um, you know, person in, in an organisation is often a, often a man. And so that, that can often impact on, on attitudes towards women in an organisation. And so the attitudes towards women then lead, can lead to sexual harassment. So, so it's, it's often improving those cultures, bringing in a diverse range of people into organisations, and it's what we're talking about here. Bringing diversity into an organisation can often mitigate that risk of, of, of harassment and bullying taking place. Um, having education, of course, education and training is really important, but also responding to sexual harassment, as Vanessa said, having good grievance processes in your organisation, that people can raise these issues without being victimised, you know, um, making sure that people have options um, and also collecting data, really collecting data about this sort of stuff. And, and um, you know, a lot of time, one of the recommendations was to actually change the law to actually make it in incumbent on employers to put in things to, to actually prevent sexual harassment rather than dealing with the things when it's a mess because you know we've seen the the, the impact it has on people you know that you know can be very very um you know the, it can affect you know it seeps out into every person's you know person's life you know they, 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 if, if they are bullied or harassed at work um, it affects family relationships, it affects your health, it affects everything basically in your life. So we don't want it to get to that stage. So putting in preventative measures is really important. So if you're interested in that report, it's on the Australian Rights Commission website. Very interesting reading. It's about 900 pages, but there is an executive summary. So, um, you know, really would recommend you to have a look at that because, um, you know, before COVID, it was really a, a big, as you, as you saw in the media, hot topic in the, in, in the world. You know, So we don't want to forget it. Yeah, so... I'll, I'll, I'll shut up from there, yeah. Um, can I just uh, finish off? Thanks, Mark, for doing that. And I think, um, as Mark pointed out, the one thing about sexual harassment that's happened over recent years is that where we say it's often a problem for people filing a complaint to have the evidence that that's occurred. Mm -hmm often because of the way that it is occurring through um, technology, through texting and through emails, people have a lot of evidence and it's just amazing. So um, that, yeah. that's my no, I just made a point about inappropriate talk because a lot of times, you know, because there's different, um, you know, we, we, we find we have a lot of people who think it's acceptable to say certain things in the workplace because they've been got away with it in the past. And of course, if you've got people from different cultures in an organisation now, uh, often they will find that unacceptable. And, and, and you know, it, it's, it's sort of uh, a really, um, you know, it shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be making people uncomfortable in the workplace, you know, and so... Mm -hmm giving people the power to actually, you know, call that sort of stuff is really important because, you know, often it starts with, with that sort of stuff and it, it escalates into, into something more serious unless it's dealt with. So, yeah, very, very important that um, these sort of codes of conduct and standards are set in, in, in an employer. Hmm. And Cornelius asks, what protection do bosses have from false sexual allegations in terms of sexual harassment? Is that correct? Hmm. Yeah, um, well, I, I guess it, it, it's really, um, you know, again, um, w w as Diana said, we, we're, a, we're a, a neutral organisation, so we investigate complaints. So in other words, if, if it appears that the person is making it up and, and, and it appears as though their story doesn't stack up, the commissioner can still dismiss the complaint. So we, we don't take the side of either, either party during that, that situation. And all the discussions are confidential. And so, therefore, um, you know, we do stress that confidentiality to all parties concerned. So, in other words, if a person is, is making a vexatious complaint, for example, um, and it's found out the commissioner dismisses it, and then, you know, obviously the, the employer then can take... We, we, we can't sort of get person sacked or anything, but obviously that would 
would be a um, would be a situation that's happened. I mean, it's happened. I don't know, Diana, if you want to comment any further on that. The only thing I could add to that, Dick, because we don't have, as Mark said, either a complaint would be dismissed as lacking in substance, or that it would be um, seen as being vexatious. But the person has the right themselves to take it to the state administrative tribunal. If it was found that it was vexatious at the State Administrative Tribunal, then they would look to probably award costs against the person who brought the complaint. And that has happened um, on a number of occasions. And in fact, I think it did happen in a matter with a, a, a woman from the police who had pursued an action and she did face um, cost. I mean, again, that's you know, that's probably not the cost it is to the individuals or the organisation, um, but it is. And the State Administrative Tribunal you know, will usually tell complainants that up front that they could, if it's looking like that they're really pursuing something that's, you know, on the face of it, not, not a case, they will be forewarned of that, um, that matter. So we have, I mean, we, we sort of base on the principle of natural justice that people who are accused of doing something have a right to have their say as well. So it's it's basically enshrined in our in our um, in our process. Um, the only other thing I was just going to say back to our complaint process, and it perhaps goes a little bit to Joy's question, but it was also very um, with reference to something that Rita. Um, spoke about in her presentation and that understanding that sometimes there's a hesitancy because of um, people's cultural background, hesitancy to raise an issue that might be quite personal. Um, but if you, in terms of, an employer has to know what, what the underlying condition is um, and I think very much that's Vanessa's presentation as well. So if you file a complaint of impairment discrimination and say my employer didn't consider my condition, and the employer says, well, I had no idea what the condition was because they never told me, um, that would under clearly undermine your complaint because the employer has to know what the issue is to have actively discriminated against the person on that basis. So as difficult as that might be in terms of, of your own upbringing or your um, your whole life bringing. It is important employers are clear about what your circumstances are so they can hopefully make that accommodation that you need. So, um, and just lastly, um, Ephraim, we have put on our last slide just our contact details um, and about how people can contact us. We probably need to change that. We're moving within four weeks. Um, but the phone number will stay the same. Um, we're moving to Albert Placey House. We're a lot more central across the road from the Perth Railway Station. And the other, just I know, um, again, Vanessa gave a few points of reference for people to follow up um, on their rights. The Employment Law Centre is a very valuable resource. Now, they are always very busy. Um, but they have a very good website um, with lots of um, quite useful uh, um, fact sheets. So I would recommend people going to them. I know they're shortly going to merge with the humanitarian group and Tenancy WA, so it will be a bit of a one-stop shop for a lot of people. Um, so that will make it a very interesting service. But I think they, they'd still probably keep their website going for the time being. Yeah, I think uh, Diana, that's a very good point. Usually, we ha we also have the um, equal of uh, sorry employment law centre uh, being part of this uh, initiative. Uh, they they just couldn't uh, attend this one. We may have them on subsequently. Uh, we mm -hmm. also have our website linked to most of the uh, very valuable resources they're giving us. They go ahead to embed it on our website. That has been very useful. Uh, but again, if anybody needs extra information, follow up information here, just let us know. Just like Linda said earlier on, we'll also share 
uh, these slides uh, with the participants. Just a, I'll just put in a question, uh, last question, the difference between the Equal Opportunity Commission and the Human Rights Commission. The Equal Opportunity Commission administers the um, state WA Equal Opportunity Act, whereas the Human Rights Commission administers the uh, federal acts, the uh, DDA, the RDA, the, the Race Discrimination Act, the Disability Discrimination Act, the Age Discrimination Act. We're both, we're both discrimination organisations, but we're separate. So people can lodge complaints under the federal or the state act, but not both. And, and very important, particularly with race discrimination, is that if you feel, and it's probably better to talk to us, don't file anything with us, um, because if you want to pursue a matter under the Federal Race Discrimination Act, even if you've written to us, they will sometimes not accept the complaint. So it's, if you feel that there might be a race discrimination issue, perhaps speak to them first. Mm. Can I just quickly, I was, I was wanting to, for time's sake, hold on to this, but just, I'm just itching to quickly ask, uh, uh, with regards to the Australian context, um, there's this general feeling that there is a kind of irreverence uh, in the Australian culture. Uh, I don't know whether that's a bogus statement. Uh, so does that make your job harder in terms of when you are defining what is sexual? Because sometimes the Australian, the average Australian would joke about some things that some other cultures may find offensive. And one of the things I picked up early here, I haven't lived here now for almost 20 years, is a, is a feeling that Australian is generally irreverent. So does that make, does that make your work harder? Right. Yeah, I, I think I think you know having having sort of because uh, I've been doing training for quite a long time and and um, I think a lot of the times a lot of these things can be misunderstandings and and people you know as as um, Rika was saying the different styles and different attitudes towards hierarchy um, so I think half of it is having a good communication channel in your, in your workplace, you know, and, and sort of being able to educate each other as to what's acceptable and what, what isn't. I mean, you have the, you have your codes of conduct and all the formal stuff, but, but also there, there needs to be some sort of a culture of um, the fact that everyone's, everyone's different and, you know, you need to accept that difference. And, and so, um, you know, and it comes back to how the organisation is led and, and, you know, if people give each other permission to, to, to sort of, challenge um, anything that they find difficult to deal with then you know th there's an honesty there in the organization that can can actually then help um, those sort of misunderstandings to be dealt with quickly because part of the whole thing is that often these misunderstandings as I said escalate into something a lot worse and and you know we see a lot of discrimination complaints we start off with well, yeah with the sort of things you're talking about you know the, the little um, little digs the comments the irreverent stuff that people mis might misunderstand the intent but as I've said before the intent is irrelevant and so if it, if it escalates, then, then you know, it, it becomes a complaint of harassment, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we, can, if we can cut that off before it becomes a, you know, be, before it gets to a real formal stage, then, you know, and, and bystanders and, and, and all sorts of informal things can, can actually help to, to, to stop those things from becoming major issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, Sorry, I, I'm not quite sure whether one of the what you're raising could also be an issue about um, you, you might have people from different cultural groups or it might be religious groups and you know this might be if people perhaps are, are profoundly religious so they might find certain behaviours more difficult and more offensive than others and if that type of behaviour is done to, to offend them so it mightn't be sexual in nature, but really that behaviour is almost having a go at them on their religious beliefs. Then that could be religious discrimination or religious conviction discrimination. I think, Mark, you had, there was that example, wasn't there, about the guy who was quite a, a, had a strong Christian belief. Yeah. And the employers did, uh, employees played practical jokes that had a bit of a sexual nature about it. So it wasn't yeah. sexual harassment, but it was found to be potentially religious, yeah. religious conviction discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, you know, again, it's sort of sort of thing which you think, well, you know, good leadership would pick that up and then try and resolve it before it got to a formal formal complaint. But, you know, but yeah, sometimes organisations don't have the processes in place to do that. Oh, there is a question in the box there. Um, why do managers, supervisors use performance and assessment tools to victimise and bully employees? And just going on what Mike said, I think it is about leadership and poor leadership and... Um, those managers or supervisors can be seen as a or using their status to bully people into getting what they want as opposed to using collaboration tools, which obviously I prefer. But if a, an employee is being bullied, then they need to raise that. It's, it's really important in this day and age that people aren't allowed to get away with any tactics that are bullying, intimidating or victimising, as I'm sure Diana and Mike would agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, I think a lot, a lot of um, a lot of managers are often promoted, um, you know, and not given the development by their organisations, you know, to, to actually conduct those uh, really difficult discussions with people, and so you know they will revert to to what they know, which is obviously sometimes to, to actually bully people and, and, and try and push people into doing things, but that's never going to work with individuals. And sometimes if no one makes a stand, they'll never yeah. know. And it yeah. just takes courage to make yeah. a stand. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get people coming to talk to me and I go, that's fine and I can do something about this, but will you make a statement? Will you stand by that statement? Because going to an employee said, someone said something and they in, intimated this, there's, there's no substance to it. Yeah. There has to be substance to it and, there, and it has to be answerable. And to be able to do that, you need somebody to make a stand. And uh, in terms of the training that we do for um, supervisors and managers, I mean, this question comes up a lot, but more from often from um, managers and saying, look, I'm always accused of bullying when I use performance and assessment tools. Now, it is an employee's right. Um, I'm sorry, an employer's right to, to have performance and assessment tools. And really, if they use properly, if there is some issue about underperformance, then it is a necessary thing to try to get the person to be able to, to do their job effectively. But it has to be open and transparent and it has to be a reasonable process. Um, if people are um, using it inappropriately and people are being targeted because of one of the characteristics of our act, then that could potentially be the grounds for discrimination. But it's, you know, we don't cover bullying generally, but if it's clearly marked because um, of somebody's race or their impairment um, or their age, then that forms the ground for discrimination. Mm. And bullying would come under the Fair Work Act, so that would go to Fair Work and you would need to, it's, it's a, a number there you can call, anyone can call it and talk to them about it and talk to them about a process that you can follow if you feel you are being bullied. Just with performance management too, um, one of the things we talk to managers about is actually actually sitting down with your staff more often than the actual performance management, you know, like trying to, you know, set up a regular feedback so there's no surprises when it comes to the performance management uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So often employers don't do not do that. They, they'll just sit down after six months and say, look, you know, oh, yeah, you're not doing very well, are you? <laughs> and then, of course, the person then reacts in a negative way. I'm not saying all of them like that, you know, because some people deliberately bully others, but sometimes it can be that misunderstanding again because you don't regularly give feedback to your, to your employee. So, again, we try and encourage managers. Right. So, um, does anybody else have anything to add or any questions of uh, generic nature? Okay. All right. Uh, Ephraim, over to you. Have you got anything to add at this moment? No, I think, um, yes, I just want to uh, apologise that we ran ahead of, of schedule a bit. I think it was a very uh, valuable conversation. Um, I'm so glad that the patience was there. I know that uh, Joe will still round up. And I think, Linda, the point you made there, and um, I'm sure Vanessa will not mind um, if, if Fred still feel like 
putting a few words together as long as it's not much of uh, we can discuss this offline. I'll check with Vanessa. She can still support general advice, not not one that would task her time. But while Fred was sharing that as well, I'm I'm hoping that a few other people also learned a few things there. And uh, thank you very much. I will now hand over to uh, yes, Linda. Nothing more from you again. Nothing more from you. Uh, Joy, would you like to wrap up or are you, are you happy for me to, to now conclude? Okay, Joy's still on mute there. Oh, we can't hear you, Joy. Hello. Hi. 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 Thanks, Linda. Um, thank you, everybody, um, for participating and um, especially our incredible panel, um, Vanessa, Rika, Dana, Mark, and Ephraim. Um, as always, you know, it's been a very, you know, informative and educative um, session. Personally, <laughs> I have, have um, had the opportunity to learn a lot, you know, from members of the panel. And um, I would like everybody that is present, you know, if you have the time to please, you know, um, give us some feedback via the chat. If you don't have the time, you can send us an email. You've got our details, you know, on our website. I also want to briefly talk about the next two events that are coming up. On the May 6th, we've got um, Recruitment 101, Preparing for Employment in Lockdown and Post-COVID Era. It will be at the same time, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And of course, online. <laughs> we are in a very peculiar time, but yeah, we are, we are so lucky for technology. <laughs> And on the 12th of May, we've got um, um, Keeping Mentally Fit and Competitive for Work, Now and Post-COVID-19. So please check out this, um, more information on, about this program online on our website. You can go check it out. And um, also register because I'm aware the they are limited spaces, limited them. And that would be all. Thank you so much, everybody. I really enjoyed this session. Thank you for coming on and then having this meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you to everyone. And good night. And we'll, we will uh, get a copy of the presentations uh, out to participants uh, where permitted and um, we hope to see you at the uh, at future meetings. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.